So, again, good morning. Uh, I'm Gabriele Pesce uh, and I work for uh, Eurit Empower in the DAC Plus Technology Platform branch. It is the innovation, innovation research uh, platform on district heating and cooling at European level. Um, we are partner of the, this uh, Cool DH project. It's Innovation Action Research and Innovation Action, founded under Horizon 2020 funding program. And we are very proud of being part of this uh, initiative because I think that uh, Cool DH uh, is one of the most advanced and pioneering projects uh, in the landscape of the ongoing initiative on this heating and ultra low and low temperature uh, projects. We can even speak about fifth generation district heating. Um, just to mention, Reto, the coordinator of, from COWI, will introduce us to, to the main features of the project. But just let me say that, for example, uh, we have the large, in this project, we have the largest uh, low temper, world largest low temperature network. So that's already a very, a very uh, important feature. Um, this webinar follows the first technical workshop that was organized uh, in June in Brussels and is dedicated to all the technical and scientific community uh, all around Europe. Um, as logistical speaking, uh, you are all mute, so if you need to speak, just remind to unmute yourself. Um, there is a useful chat where you can write your question, and the question and answer session will be uh, at the end of the webinar. Uh, the webinar is uh, divided in two main parts. The first part is more policy oriented, and the second part is more on technical uh, results. But uh, as we have just two hours, I will let the floors to the coordinator, Mr. Reto Umasioi, that will present us uh, the, 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 the general feature of the, of the project. So, Reto, you should now have the control of the keyboard and mouse. The floor yes. is... Hello and uh, welcome from my side as well. I will give you a general introduction to uh, Cool TH uh, project, as Gabriella uh, said. Um, I just have to see if I can switch the slide. You maybe switch the slide, uh, Gabriel. Yeah. So um, the as Gabriel mentioned, Cool DH is a pioneering project for for district heating uh, solutions, and especially for low temperature district heating, and even uh, showing the solutions for ultra low temperature. Um, Myself, I work, I'm the project coordinator and I work uh, at Kobe, which is a consulting uh, company. Um, the um, Cool DH uh, project is basically a Danish Swedish uh, collaboration. Uh, we are uh, 11 partners uh, from three countries. Um, and we have uh, it's centered about uh, two demonstration sites which is on both sides of copenhagen which you will see between the two red dots on the map uh, on the right side we have the city of lund uh, where there is a, a quarter called uh, where it is uh, the plan to uh, to establish the the uh, uh, total district supplied with um, uh, low temperature district heating with about uh, 60 65 degrees in flow and 
and 30-35 in return. Um, it is uh, an area where about 40,000 people, uh, when it's built out, will uh, live and, and work. So it's a new area and we are showing uh, solutions for uh, new uh, buildings. Um, the um, uh, heat is generated by research facilities, uh, particle accelerators, um, which I will come uh, back to. Um, on the Danish side, in Højtostrup, on the western side of Copenhagen, uh, we have a smaller area where uh, existing buildings are being connected with low temperature uh, district heating. And here the uh, concept is to utilize surplus cooling from a shopping mall. And the temperature level here will be uh, slightly lower, about uh, 50, 53 degrees in uh, flow temperature. Now we are in the project right in the middle uh, of a four year uh, project. So we have done the, the development uh, and the innovative parts uh, of the project. And now we are turning into the cons actual construction followed by monitoring. Now, why is cool DH cool? Uh, it is the, the name is taken because it utilizes low grade and low temperature heat sources to produce uh, low temperature district heating. That is uh, from cooling plants and also integrated with the production of cooling. And it's also a relatively cold surplus heat. Um, and it is used to optimize cool or low temperature district heating solutions. We also find that it is cool because we integrate the use of renewable energy, which is both produced uh, at the uh, production side or used at the production side, but also produced locally to supplement uh, the district heating supply. What we also think is cool is that uh, we demonstrate the full supply chain from where energy is produced through trans transmission lines, through distribution, and all out in the uh, user installations with all components in between, some of them in new concepts. All these uh, new solutions we collect in uh, a catalog which can be used afterwards for people to uh, design similar systems. So if we look at Bonshoi area, uh, you will see here that uh, we have the research facility, uh, Max Führer is the first one, which is a particle accelerator that has a lot of magnets that are to be uh, in very stable uh, temperature condition, not to, to move. And therefore the power is always uh, on them or also in idle load. So they use energy, but there's a contract that the energy for it comes from renewable sources. That is basically hydropower and also uh, from wind. And then it generates heat at different temperatures in the beginning up to uh, about seven megawatt and when another facility called ESS uh, is uh, also connected in the future it will be able to raise up to 30 megawatt of uh, heat released. The low temperature heat is boosted to usable uh, temperature level and then distributed out to the buildings and in some of the buildings will show that you can also produce your own energy, uh, for instance, by solar collectors, uh, PV panels that can drive a heat pump. So you can boost the temperature to the needed temperature level for domestic hot water. Um, some of the heat is also released at higher temperatures and here it can be transmitted out in the normal 
district heating network um, and in this way replace uh, biomass that is, is used in the combined heat and power plant in the area. So we free biomass as a resource that can be used for other purposes or can be used in other places, for instance, in Denmark, where we use a lot of biomass. So when you make such a system with low temperature, you have some technical questions. Uh, one is how to avoid Legionella in your hot domestic water system when you have low temperature grids. That's one question. Another question is when you utilize combination of cooling machines and heat pump, what is the optimal design of those configuration at the supply side? When you go to the uh, multifamily houses, you can ask yourself, what is the, the uh, optimal solution for the substations? And also uh, think about if, would it be possible to connect appliances directly to the uh, supplied uh, district heating? I switch to Hoya uh, Tostrup. Uh, and also the supplied area uh, called Österby, uh, a district in the center of uh, Hoytostro. And here you should uh, think of that we have a shopping mall with already on the roof about 16,000 square meters of PV. Uh, they have, since it was installed, uh, increase their efficiency on the uh, all the shops and also reduce the cooling demand by different ways so today they produce more electricity than they can use uh, themselves and export more to the grid now the feed-in tariff is uh, reducing over time so uh, it comes to a point where the earnings are low of supplying it to the grid and they consider using this electricity for other purposes. And here we look at having a cooling machine and a heat pump combined so we can produce low temperature district heating for the neighboring area and we can produce district cooling for neighboring areas. So we have always demand on both sides and then we will be able to utilize uh, the system not only for the shopping mall but also in the integrated in the area so here you ask yourself um, how to design the uh, local grids uh, for low temperature in the best most efficient way and how to integrate the renewables and uh, also, how to deal with the, with the legislative and regulatory framework associated to do so. So, um, I'm trying to shift the picture. Gabriel, can you uh, help? To, yes. So uh, that is what we will um, now um, um, hear about today, where we have picked some of these questions and uh, will present them in the following presentations. Uh, that is uh, about the first coming here, uh, legislative and regulatory framework, and then about the Legionella situation, the new piping systems, the heat, possibility of heat-driven appliances, and optimization of heat pumps. So um, I will not take the questions now. Uh, you can write them to Gabriele, it will come in the end, but you can see more information on cooldh.eu and you can see here the partners that are involved in the project. So with this, I will give the word again to uh, Gabriele uh, for the next uh, speaker to present. Thank you. Thank you, Reto. Maybe you should. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Reto, for this introduction. So, as already mentioned, the second uh, 
the second presentation will deal with uh, the legislative and regulatory framework uh, study. It's a very important deliverable uh, about uh, the differences between the two uh, main uh, legislative framework that all the age has to deal with so the Danish one and the Swedish one because um, because of the high innovation and the extreme cap edging uh, technology of cool the age uh, we have to deal with a new uh, landscape uh, from the regulatory um, point of view so uh, I will leave the floors to uh, Mr. Olesen project manager senior project manager uh, of uh, Kowi uh, Yes, hello. I'm Stein Olsen. Um, I'm, as mentioned, project manager in uh, Kobe, working closely together in the team with uh, Reto Hummelshoi and other good colleagues. And uh, we have um, performed, we have uh, digged into the legislative and regulatory framework, looking on the aspects uh, 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 sort of in place uh, now, the re regulatory framework uh, in place at, uh, at now, but also trying to look into what might and what is foreseen to be the change over time, because definitely the regulatory framework uh, is not uh, optimized and not streamlined to make it possible to utilize uh, surplus heat uh, and um, uh, that is what we have been looking into. So um, first of all, uh, you could see say that uh, it is uh, uh, sort of coincidence that uh, two countries so close to each other actually have uh, uh, quite different uh, approach to how to regulate uh, the sort of basic area. Uh, district heating and collective uh, collective uh, energy supply to districts. So there's a different legal framework. On the Danish side, you could say it's a very regulated, highly regulated area, with uh, the municipality in the in the center uh, needing to approve all uh, changes of the heat supply in a certain city area, and on the other side. Uh, we have uh, the Danish, no, the Swedish side, where it's a relatively market-based, uh, market-based situation. So that's two completely different setups, and you could say that um, everything. Uh, and, and and when we look out in on the European, um, in the other European countries, it is maybe more similar to the Swedish side, where it's um, more market-based situation. You could say the Danish uh, side is uh, um, uh, a good thing to have a highly regulated uh, situation when you really want to change things as in the 70s when uh, Denmark wanted to go, go away from oil to and then transform this, uh, to, to district heating and uh, natural gas. That was a good situation. You could control that uh, transition, but now it seems that we need to loosen up a little and make it more easy to pick up the different waste streams uh, produced on different sites. So that is definitely gonna change. Um, okay, that was the that was a short about the introduction to that, and I will also in the end shortly present and give an overview of of the different legal requirements on uh, district you know, domestic hot water production, which is uh, kind of a, a t um, you know, that's the unpleasant part of this uh, transition to low temperature district heating, because we need to get, uh, have a good control of the Legionella in the, in the domestic hot water so that everything is safe on the, on the, on the, on the road. But that is, um, in short, as mentioned, uh, we have a high degree of re regulation. It's uh, very complex, uh, need a lot of steps to get a project uh, approval, 
as it is called to change from one type of uh, heat source in an area to another and definitely there is a complex uh, tax regulation what is um, the extra price you have to pay on top of uh, your energy pro production price price and uh, and what will what will be the final price for the for the customers that is uh, going to change as mentioned um, uh, because we because we need to to uh, look on the system boundaries uh, and that is definitely something that the government in Denmark is looking at in order to uh, meet the 70 percent reduction target for 2030 that has just been uh, set uh, by the new government in Denmark on the Swedish side um, you could say it's it's still it's it's it, it as I mentioned very market driven situation, but still it need to be a competitive project so that they need they need to be also from an environmental perspective they need to be a focus on uh, tra transforming the heat source away from fossil uh, based uh, uh, sources. So both sides very focused. Both sides. Uh, uh, sort of um, helpful for the transition to to towards uh, the fossil free um, and flexible energy system and uh, there's definitely something to look for uh, as the heat roadmap Europe 4 from October 18 uh, stated that there is a lot of energy out there um, maybe at lower temperatures, but there's a lot of energy out there to be picked up and uh, used uh, and also combined with the use, a larger use of uh, heat pumps. So that's highly relevant project, highly relevant um, to, to fix also the legal framework to, to support the transition. I think there is there's not a lot to um, you could say there's there's something to, I would like to mention um, the basic principles uh, on the Danish side here and they have not changed uh, a lot since the 1979 when it was um, <clears throat> first uh, approved a lot of changes have has been made during the years but basically it's the same principles we need a uh, make sure and promote a, a security of energy supply and that is part of the approval process that you need to sort of uh, make sure that it is a secure energy supply it need to uh, be documented that it will reduce the environmental impact in comparison to the, the what you want to uh, get away from and you need a document that uh, energy savings and co2 savings on the primary energy primary energy uh, that goes into the uh, district heating uh, supply and then definitely you need a, a document that there is a socio-economic um, favorable project that 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 is approved and that last thing here is also the you could say key to the uh, weakness of the system that it, we need to solve that equation because it's a governmental defined uh, equation that we need to enter all the uh, data into and uh, they can sort of uh, from the desk uh, in a government office decide whether a project can be approved or not and that is a balance that need to be um, looked deeply into also it has been said that uh, the Danish government will do that because at the moment it is uh, still very hard to get uh, new districts uh, um, transformed into uh, district heating. It competes very heavily with the, it's, it is outcompeted with uh, uh, individual heat pumps sometimes and also um, aggressive um, approaches from the natural gas companies. So, so the balance need to be moved and that is through an uh, evaluation of the math you could say the government the governmental decided uh, mathematics uh, 
but yeah that was part of that and we have uh, more than 400 uh, non-profit district heating companies in Denmark so it's not that it doesn't work and we cannot uh, make it um, compete against others so, so that's the basic then this is only covering that part of the district heating companies uh, that focuses on supplying district heating a lot of companies like in uh, the Copenhagen area at district heating companies they also have a um, uh, sort of a market-based um, cooling supply and the cooling supply is organized di slightly different from district heating company to district heating company um, some have uh, separated the delivery of district cooling completely and some has an integrated approach in Hoytostrup where we are um, looking uh, deeper into it, they have decided to sort of keep a, the cooling business within the same organization and then making it um, clear in the bookkeeping what is, uh, what is, what is uh, district cooling delivery and what is uh, district heating delivery. And this makes it uh, uh, more easy for them to look into projects like in the Østerby area where we um, have a district heating customer with uh, excess um, uh, PV as the shopping malls that we are going uh, that they're ready to introduce and, um, and, and we can make interesting business cases on top of that and that is what we are really really looking into so let's have a look on that um, the, the the key uh, that need to be uh, the key problem that need to be sort of uh, solved and and find ways through is the tax. How can we sort of argue um, the right way to make it uh, the best possible business case? Um, the thing is that, uh, as I mentioned, there's a surplus heat tax, but it is changed or it will be changed at least because at the moment um, it is actually not directly possible to you cannot just give away the heat uh, the city sh two shopping mall would uh, uh, maybe actually like to just give it away because they want to, they want to cool things but uh, that cannot be done without a tax on top of that but what is foreseen is that we have um a tax uh, on the heat that is uh, uh, picked up from the heat pump the cooling machines on between 5 to 12 euros per megawatt hour and uh, the business case in this uh, situation will be helped a lot because from the uh, pv panels the pv with no um, that produces electricity with no tax on it because we are having this cooling machine within the shopping mall the cooling machine is uh, you can take it as a shop as uh, one of the other shops they are behind the main uh, meter of the shopping mall and uh, the electricity can be used in the in the cooling machines and there is only tax on the share of electricity that is bought from the grid sorry so this will can, yes can, sorry uh, can try you to isolate some way it's nice to have your family with you but maybe there is too much noise in the background so people are complaining a little bit uh, okay don't, i don't know if you have a door to shut it uh i cannot uh, okay okay it is, so. it is difficult to do something about it i uh, i had um okay i had to sort of arrange myself to to don't, don't worry to okay to, to, to present thank so sorry thank you anyway so okay hope you can hear it but anyway this is this is the case in the, in the in the in that we need to solve so we need to find the right balance between between the taxation, uh, between the organization of uh, of uh, how will 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 it be the best case if uh, the district heating company rent a room, buy the cooling machine, sell off cooling on a commercial basis to the shopping mall, 
and then put up a meter to sell off uh, and you would say or deliver district heating low uh, low temperature district heating directly to the customers in Österby. That is probably what is going to be the the case. Uh, there is still some clarification that need to be done on this, but this is going to. Uh, I think we're going to succeed on that. Um, Okay, and then a little about the framework on the Swedish side. Um, there's a district heating law from 2008. It covers uh, pricing, uh, how to make contracts, actually also how to uh, let third parties access the DH network, meaning that it, it has already been taken care of how to uh, handle um, sort of uh, uh, that part. Uh, to integrate with uh, prosumers. And up till uh, 2014, uh, uh, companies, uh, DH companies were not obliged to, obliged to admit access to the network. Um, um, but, uh, but, but that is, that is now, that is, that is now, uh, that is now in place so that um, they should be able to, and uh, they should be able to to arrange themselves. But it is still uh, a case where the uh, third parties coming in or wanting to to uh, access the, the network, they, they they need a sort of um, uh, document um, that they can um, deliver uh, the quality that is uh, required by the DH company. So there's there's something that need to be. Uh, uh, looked into still to, to make it more easy. But um, on the Swedish side, as uh, we uh, will uh, maybe hear, no, not, I'm not sure we're going to hear about that. So I'll talk a little about that. It, they are, it is possible for the district heating company to um, uh, set up prices for, for instance, the, the the Brunsberg area, they can set up a new pricing scheme that, and that is what they have done. That is allowed, that is not allowed on the Danish side. It's a fixed price for delivery of district heating. On the Swedish side, it is possible to set up a, a specific, a separate price for the uh, alternative low temperature product. And that is a good thing. So it's more, more is possible on the speed side. And then uh, definitely it's uh, uh, easier uh, to uh, pick up the heat uh, and use it, utilize it because there's no taxes on delivery, delivery of surplus heat to the district heating grid. So that is, uh, a positive thing. You can uh, use uh, more of the total cap capex uh, to invest in in the heat pump in the system uh, uh, connect connection, uh, and 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 still have a, a good uh, business case on on that. And um, and then on top of that, those uh, tax reductions on the electricity used for energy production. So um, um, yeah. that is that is that is two things that is uh, 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 sort of promoting the pickup of uh, surplus heat on the Swedish side. Um, if we then go to that, that is uh, how to 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 sort of uh, introduce it, how to pick up uh, surplus heat, how to make the business case work, but can we actually um, deliver uh, what is uh, uh, a safe a quality of domestic hot water? And um, you could say, what is safe? Colleagues uh, from the University of uh, Lund has uh, uh, prepared a full report on that. It is uh, possible to find that on the QDH uh, webpage. And here's just the conclusion of it. And uh, that is, uh, we, um, 
we see that on the Swedish side, there's sort of a, you'd simply just need to have 60 degrees in the tank. Uh, and in smaller systems, you might be able to go a little lower, but you need to have a 60 degrees um, on the tap uh, in, in the tank and a minimum of 50 degrees uh, in the in the in the uh, in the tap. This, of course, sets quite some limitations on what to do, and um, you need a you need a um, you need to have something that tops up the temperature. It could be uh, heating tracing, uh, micro heat pumps, or um, instead instantaneous water heating uh, instead of using the district heating uh, directly, meaning that you need uh, some kind of uh, renewable electricity source uh, near your, uh, uh, in, in the building. And, um, but in, on the other side in countries like in, in Germany and France, they, they go more, they have a sort of a split situation where you can on smaller systems, go lower in temperature because the risk is has been identified as lower. So um, there is a, a requirement of only 50 degrees uh, on the German side on smaller systems. And and and, and in France uh, the tree litter rule is is in place on, on the on the on the on the smaller systems. But definitely that is what uh, you uh, colleagues from, from Lund um, University uh, concluded is that more research is needed to bring bring uh, clarity to what is actually needed to to have a safe system. And on the Danish side, and that is what we, uh, we use uh, uh, in the Österby installations, is that we um, um, uh, use the re requirements as they are to to have at least um, fifty five degrees in the in the, the tap water and uh, actually in, uh, in peak hours uh, as low as 45 degrees. And this is of course, when it is in uh, smaller systems with smaller volumes so that um, we will not um, have the risk uh, of uh, Legionella in the system. That is, um, that was a brief, uh, a brief uh, overview of, uh, of where we are today and what we are looking into. It's a lot about uh, regulation. It's quite different from the Danish and Swedish side. Can, we can use that uh, as inspiration, also as input for changes to the legislation. And uh, definitely we need to be careful on the, on the domestic hot water production. And uh, maybe a combination of uh, temperature topping with uh, other treatment types could be uh, relevant. And that is also something that has been uh, summed up in uh, uh, technical um, uh, uh, deliverables uh, from the project that how can we treat the water so that will not uh, jeopardize the safety of the people using and living in the, in the, in the low temperature district heated uh, houses. Yeah, thank you for now and uh, questions. Any questions? Thank you, Stan. Uh, I think, uh, okay, no, I know that you have to leave. So yeah, if you have questions now for Stan, uh, please ask them now because Stan uh, won't be able to stay in the webinar. Okay, so for the moment, okay, no questions. Uh, thank, yeah. you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, Stan. And have a nice meeting. <laughs> thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. So, uh, yes, a very interesting presentation. Of course, the waste heat contracting the regulation will be a very, very important topic for the, in the future. And it will be very interesting um, about the results of Cool DH, uh, given the very high level of the innovation in this project. So also for the replication of contracting in the rest of Europe. Uh, a natural continuation of this topic uh, will be, of course, the presentation of uh, Professor Per Olof uh, Kalyuniemi from Lund University about, about how to avoid the risk of Legionella 
in low temperature uh, networks. So, uh, Peter Olof, the floor is uh, uh, yours. Okay. Uh, first, how how much time do I have? Uh, you have uh, ten. We are delayed. Uh, a little bit, but don't don't worry. Okay. Yes. Live. Okay. Uh, this probably going to be some. Um, Okay, uh, hello, my name is Perlov and um, I work at Lund University. I'm actually Associated Professor, not Professor. Um, and me and my colleagues and some master's students have worked on the topic on how to avoid risk of Legionella. And the background to this is that Legionella is uh, when the temperature levels in the, in the district heating network are reduced, um, there might be risks of Legionella. So first, I need to change slide. Could you please help me? Thank you. So first, what is Legionella and why it's a problem? Legionella are bacteria that are naturally exist in freshwater environments, but they also have been found in seawaters and soils. Legionella can cause illnesses such as Legionnaire's disease and Pontiac fever. And Legionnaire's disease is a severe variant of panomia, and Pontiac fever is a milder influenza. And the comfort zone temperature level of Legionella is within the same range as the comfort level of domestic hot water. Legionella has an optimal growth rate at around 40 degrees Celsius. Legionella likes stagnant water and can be present, uh, present in biofilm and protosa, where conditions for growth can be even more suitable. And in order to prohibit Legionella growth, natural requirements on domestic hot water system and temperature levels has been set, uh, as Stan also shown. And the temperature levels are set in order to avoid the growth of Legionella. But when the available temperature for preparing the domestic hot water is reduced, special measures must be taken into account. And when talking about Legionella, it's one thing that is important to keep in mind it is that uh, you could only get sick from Legionella through aerosols, not by drinking or being in contact with the water as water, even if it's containing Legionella bacteria. We change slides. Thanks. Try to click no. on the screen because you should have the control according to. I click on the screen. Uh, strange. Okay. It's nothing is happening. It's very strange. Okay. So, what we've done in the study is that we have done a, a literature study with the aim to answer some of the questions of. First, we looked at the legislations associated with Legionella in domestic hot water for some different countries. We looked at legislation in Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Norway, France, and Germany. And then we looked at the incidence of Legionnaire's disease for these countries to see if there is a relationship between the regulations and the incidence. And we also wanted to make an overview of the available techniques for avoiding issues with Legionella and to look at how these techniques compile with regulation on domestic hot water system. Still not able to change slide. Okay, this slide, uh, Stan already shown you. Uh, it shows the different temperature requirements for a uh, different system for the different countries that we looked into. Uh, in, in general, all countries have regulation on domestic hot water temperature within the range or above the range of Legionella growth. However, the minimum system temperature is uh, differs between the countries. Norway and Finland has the highest Uh, as the highest temperature difference, has the highest temperature levels, and Denmark, Germany, and France has the lowest. And as Stan also said, in Denmark, we have this 45 degrees during peak hours, 
and Germany and France, they apply to the three liter rule, which allows lower temperature if the, system, the volume of the domestic hot water system is less than three liters. You want me to change the slide? Because, uh, yes, please. We hear when, we, when I click. Your, your system doesn't allow me to give you the control in the part place, right? Doesn't seem like that, no. Okay. So uh, for the All rest right. of the presentation, tell me when you need to. I need to change the slide. I do a beep or something. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yes. This um, shows. Um, the incidence of Ligonel's for the Ligonel's disease for the six countries that we uh, looked into, and as seen, the the countries with the the lowest temperature demand for domestic hot water are the ones that has the highest uh, incidences. Uh, the grey bar represents Denmark, and the dark blue represents uh, France. Of course, there could be many other explanations to this. Uh, we can't really say that there is a, a correlation. Um, so this could be explained in man, many other reasons as well. Please change. So we looked at some treatment methods of how to uh, handle or reduce risk of Ligonella. And the, the treatments that we, we looked into could divide into three groups. It's mechanical treatment, sterilization, and alternative system design. Good change. And mechanical treatment uh, is basically filters, and filters can be used with success at the end point of use. Uh, the principle is to avoid Legionella bacteria from leaving the domestic hot water system. Uh, could use sterilization, and the techniques for steri sterilization could be injecting agents, chemical agents such as chlorine or ionization which could also work, but chemical treatment could also work with oxidization such as UV light and, oh, did I do that? No? Such as UV light and uh, photocatalysis. And other, um, or to avoid Legonella could have alternative system design. The system could be built in a way where there is no good environment for Legonella growth. And that could be done with decentralized substations or with additional uh, or with additional uh, uh, heating. Uh, as Stan also mentioned, it could be electric heat tracing, micro heat pump, or instantaneous electric heater. And by using additional heating, that could fulfill temperature requirements in the present regs regulations. And decentralized substations could fulfill requirements if regulation of the three liter rule is applied. Please change. So to some main conclusions, uh, there are different temperature requirements for domestic hot waters in the different countries that we looked into. And there are higher incidence of ligon ligonosis in countries with lower temperature requirements. However, it is impossible to say if this is, this is ca a causal relationship. Uh, there are promising techniques that can prevent Legionella in other ways than thermal treatment. However, more research is needed to say if it will be safe to use them and use them as a single method. And in case of the low temperature district heating, we the supply district heating temperature below 50 degrees. Techniques such as sterilization filters are not possible to use as a single method today due to the temperature requirements. But however, the decentralized substation could be used, but only in the countries where the three liter rule is applied. And if techniques to avoid Legionella can be proven to be successful as a single method, well, the regulations for the domestic hot water preparation needs to be uh, updated or changed. That is, uh, if they are proven. And I 
gonna end there and thank you for attending. Uh, question we take afterwards. Yeah, thank you, Barab. You were very quick for such a complex uh, topic and sorry for the control, I don't know what's happened. So it's time to... <laughs> Uh, it's time to enter the most technical part of the of the webinar. Uh, I will be very quick uh, because we are a little bit behind the schedule. Uh, so it's uh, the floor is to Klaus Kronegar Lausen from Luxor, um, explaining us the innovative piping solution in Cool DH. Uh, Klaus, the uh, floor yes. is here. Hello, um, my name is Klaus uh, Lauridsen. Uh, you should have control. Okay. Um, I'm a senior product manager at uh, Luxter. Luxter is a company producing pre-insulated pipings for district heating, district cooling, oil and gas, and uh, the industry sector. Um, generally speaking, um, today standard pipes is steel pipes, steel pipes heavily re regulated by uh, European standards, um, calculating minimum service life of 30 years, maximum continuous operation 120 degrees and peak uh, temperature at 140. When we look into a low temperature system, um, we are talking about uh, much lower temperatures. And if we then start to calculate the theoretical lifetime of a system based on the same standards, we run into a system that is uh, designed to, to last for more than 1,000 years. So generally speaking, for low temperature systems, um, the standards have not followed um, and this end up in we are producing and uh, installing two over-engineered and two expensive systems. So we should uh, push on getting these standards updated to low temperature systems as well. What we are working on uh, I also run into problems to shift. Okay, okay. Try to click on the screen again. Or maybe you have to you received a request to have the control, so maybe you have to accept it. Okay, don't worry. I will do it for you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> the work we have done at Lockster and is still working on is to support our partners in Højtostrup and Lund um, with uh, the ideas of bubbles I have uh, shown here. And this is uh, one of the ideas is uh, service pipes where we are working with a new pipe material PERT. Um, by working with this pipe material, we are also opening up for new possible connections of uh, pipes, uh, meaning uh, welding the pipes together. We are working on uh, better insulation properties, and we are working on alarm wires to detect leakage uh, together with uh, these um, plastic pipes. And on the straight pipes, the standard steel straight pipes, we are working on a possible solution to collect and we use heat loss. And then I would like to shift. I will now go through each of, with one slide on each of these topics. The first topic is on our PERT pipes. Um, could you press one more time? Thank you. 
Um, these uh, PRT pipes is used for flexible pre-insulated pipes. Um, we are working on them with uh, 100 meter coils as well as in 12 meter lengths. Um, we have the aim here, of course, uh, to have it oxygen and water vapor, have an oxygen and water vapor barrier. Um, but using them in different pressure classes and in the cool D8, we are talking about the 10 bar, maximum 65 degrees. Service pipe dimensions up to 110 millimeter. We have split it in two. We have service pipes up to D32 millimeter, where we are using a multi-layer LOPRT which is covered by the flexible standard EN15632. Above 32 millimeter, we are to make sure we have a flexible pipe, making it as a monolayer LOPRT pipe. This is uh, what is shown on the, on the picture, where we have a PRT pipe, then we have a very thin alo barrier, that is giving us both oxygen and water vapor barrier. Um, then we have a thin PERT protection layer and this protection layer is only there to make sure we don't scratch the thin aluminum layer, layer until we have done the insulation of this. Then we have alarm wires and what is uh, making us able to at alarm wires, that is the water vapor barrier where we use the aluminium. Then we are a new foam solution and a five layer casing that is also generating a diffusion barrier. And next slide. Um, with this uh, PRT pipe, it's also opening up for new uh, ways of uh, doing uh, the connection of the service pipes, of course, using the existing press and compression couplings available in the market today. But now we are also opening up for bot or mirror welding uh, um, and electrofusion weldings, which we are still working on. Yeah, thank you. Next on the insulation properties of the foam. Here, we are working on improving it and uh, we know now that uh, we have the possibility to improve the insulation properties, uh, giving a heat loss reduction on eight to 10% compared to the best we can produce today. And that is giving an average lambda on the 0.02. Thank you. Uh, alarm wires, as I mentioned before, by having a plastic service pipe with a water vapor barrier, it allows us to include alarm wires to ensure the performance and minimum heat loss for the full lifetime of the pre-insulated pipes. Next. And then another topic, which has nothing to do with the flexible pipes, but is uh, more focusing on the existing standard steel pipes. Here we are working on a system to give us a recovery of the heat loss. This is done by adding two extra pipes which will then um, we gain collect the heat loss and uh, will allow us in the two field side installations in Højtostrup and Lund to reuse it uh, in a heat pump. Um, we have uh, done a lot of simulations together with Kovi on this and uh, the final design we have ended up with shows on simulations a positive energy recovery balance. So said in other words, we 
generate energy instead of a heat loss. Um, now we just need to have it installed and uh, evaluate if this is also how it's looking in real life. And of course, this is uh, some of the energy we'll, uh, we are recovering here will also be from the surrounding soil. Um, in general, the main challenge we see here, that is our existing standards market is heavily regulated by these European standards. And as I said before, it is a, it is a way of overdoing it when we talk about low temperature systems. As we see it, we are getting closer and closer to a real alternative to pre-insulated steel pipes. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, now time for the second technical presentation uh, from uh, Kraftingen, uh, Clara Olkerson, project manager, that we explain to us the um, issue with the low temperature dissipating uh, connected appliances. Uh, let's see if this time the control works. Hello, everybody, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Clara, and as Gabriella said, I will be presenting a study on low temperature, district, low temperature district heating connected appliances and to see if these could be implemented at the cool DH test sites. Let's see if this works. Uh, yeah, I always, oh yeah, here it goes. Uh, I will start off by going, uh, giving a brief introduction on heat driven appliances and describe how they can be connected to the district heating grid. Then I will present the potential electricity savings that can be achieved with these appliances and present some findings from the pilot tests that were performed. And then finally, I will suggest an alternative solution, which is uh, hot water connected appliances and do a little summary. summary. Um, so what are heat driven appliances? They are machines that have um, it's dishwashers, washing machines, and tumble dryers that have heat exchangers integrated into the machines themselves. The heat exchangers are in turn connected to the building's district heating substation through a heating water circuit, uh, similar to radiators. And uh, in that way, the heat exchangers enable the process water in dishwashers and washing machines and the process air in tumble dryers to be heated partly by thermal energy instead of electricity. So uh, why do we want them then? Um, as you may know, or as you probably know, electric energy is often a more expensive form of energy. And in locations where thermal energy exists in excess, a substitution uh, from electricity to thermal energy would be a good solution. And from a district heating company point of view, um, it's, it's likely that in the future, the heat load will be uh, lower than it is today due to the increasing number of low energy buildings and still guarantee a successful business model. Uh, they must find new ways to use the heat that they produce. Um, <clears throat> heat driven appliances were developed in research projects between 2004 and 2014. A couple of different um, researchers from Swedish universities were working together with the appliance company ASCO to develop and commercialize the machines. However, in 2014, ASCO joined the Grunge Group and moved its production and development department to Slovenia. At this time, the uh, development of these appliances ended and they were never commercialized, in fact. And according to ASCO, there are currently no plans to resume the production. So this was a slightly discouraging discovery, but it was decided that um, any, to anyway evaluate the appliances and how they would have performed uh, at the Swedish and Danish test sites. Uh, and the only pre prerequisites given by ASCO were that the inlet temperature had to be at least 55 degrees to you know, achieve any worthwhile electricity savings, uh, but not higher than 80 degrees Celsius, that is, um, to not damage the, the hoses. 
Heat driven appliances can be connected to the district heating grid in a couple of different ways. Uh, one way would be to have a separate uh, heating circuit in the same way that there is a circuit for domestic hot water and space heating, which originates from the uh, main substation that is located, for example, in the basement of a building. Uh, the solution would be suitable, for example, for existing buildings uh, where there's already similar pipes installed and there's a designated shaft space. Um, but uh, and it does re require a lot of space and a lot of pipes, um, so it, it'll be less suitable for en low energy buildings uh, where there's um, there's no space heating circuits and you want to minimize the shaft space. The the other solution would be to have a secondary heating system. This is also sometimes called Vesteros uh, Modellen after the city where it was uh, tested. Um, this method requires uh, an individual substation for each household and would therefore be more suitable for new projects. Um, it requires a lot less pipes and shaft space, but there's an additional cost for the multiple substations. The separate circuit solution has uh, slightly higher heat losses than the, than the other, but um, due to the increased number uh, and length of pipes, but you can achieve significant electricity savings with both solutions. During the development of heat driven appliances, ASCO, the appliance company, uh, performed lab tests to, um, uh, to see what the potential electricity savings would be. And the results were that if the heating water is 55 degrees Celsius, the electricity savings become 0 0.48 kilowatt hours per cycle for dishwashers, 0 0.43 kilowatt hours per cycle for washing machines, and zero, uh, I'm sorry, 2.27 kilowatt hours per cycle for tumble drivers. If we then assume that the annual number of process cycles are 280 for dishwashers, 220 for washing machines, and 160 for tumble dryers, the total electricity that can be substituted in a household that has all three appliances becomes 594 kilowatt hours per year. Um, as I mentioned briefly, uh, heat-driven appliances were tested in uh, the Swedish city of Västerås, and I contacted the energy company that installed them, uh, Mala Energy, to discuss uh, their experience with them. The machines were installed around five years ago in 160 apartments and around 31 family houses. They are still in use today, and the reviews from the residents have been really, really good for the dishwashers and the washing machines. Um, on the, tum the tumble dryers, on the other hand, have been less successful since uh, they make the laundry rooms very humid uh, when they're being used. And my contact also said that they've had several new requests from customers who are interested in buying and installing uh, heat-driven appliances, but since they're no longer in production, they've had to turn them down. And he thought that the appliances would have been very popular if had the production continued, but he also um, made a request, so to say, uh, for another company to also start developing uh, heat driven appliances to create some some more um, competition. Uh, heat driven appliances were never commercialized, and so we decided to also investigate appliances with alternative tap water connections or hot water connections to see what the potential electricity savings were there. If we start with dishwashers, uh, the, there's a um, the use is limited by how heat resistant the hoses are. And we found three manufacturers that uh, claim that their dishwashers are heat resistant. And these are ASCO, Miel and Bosch. Um, and they can withstand temperatures of 70, 60 and 60 degrees Celsius respectively. Uh, installing one of these machines uh, would give an average electricity reduction of 35% or 0 0.3 kilowatt hours per cycle. Uh, washing machines have the same sensitivity issue. Uh, you, you need heat resistant hoses, but you also need uh, a washing machine that has two water connections. You need both hot and cold water. The cold water is needed because uh, in a conventional washing machine, you use cold water, for example, in the beginning of a cycle to wash the clothes and to uh, kind of dissolute the, 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 the washing powder. 
Uh, and so it would be useless to uh, substitute the already cold water with hot water. That wouldn't create any savings. Um, however, the machines that were found were only available as professional machines, that is machines that can be used in laundromats or, or common laundry rooms. And the manufacturers were ASCO, Miel, and Podab. Um, the, these washing machines can achieve electricity savings of between 60 and 87% depending on the capacity of the machine and uh, which temperature you use. So if we sum up a little bit, um, one of the aims of the study was to determine whether or not uh, heat-driven appliances could have been implemented at the cool DH test sites. And in Brunsag, in, in Sweden, the supply temperature in the grid will be approximately 65 degrees Celsius which means that the possible temperature in any secondary circuit will be around 51, 55 to 60 degrees, and it would therefore comply with the temperature requirements given by ASCO. In Hertostrup, on the other hand, the supply temperature in the grid will only be 55 degrees, and the secondary circuits will not be able to keep a temperature of 55 degrees or higher without adding electricity. And if you add electricity, then the whole the benefits of the heat driven appliances are are counteracted. Uh, and even though that it is a pity that the heat driven appliances weren't um, commercialized on, our, on the market, there are other options available, like the uh, hot water connected appliances. Um, and uh, it would be very interesting to, um, to investigate them within the cool DH project a little bit further. The dishwasher could be installed in any home uh, and can achieve um, savings of up to 35%. And the washing machines could be installed in any apartment complex that has a shared laundry room and achieve electricity savings up to 87%. Uh, important to note, however, is that the results must be um, taken uh, set in relation to the fact that the hot water temperature will not be 60 or 70 degrees at the test sites, um, and that the measurements are made on specific programs and do not actually reflect the user behavior. So the savings, electricity savings will be slightly lower than the 35 and 87%, but it will still be significant and therefore interesting to investigate. Um, another advantage with hot water connected appliances is that they don't have any temperature requirements and they could therefore be installed both at the Swedish and the Danish test sites. So, so uh, while we wait for uh, appliance companies to resume the development of heat driven appliances, they might we be a, a very good way to go. Thank you. That's all for me. If you have any questions, uh, write them and I'll ask them later. Thank you, Clara, for your interesting presentation. Yes, of course, uh, for non-technical people like me, uh, the development of low temperature network will be consequence on the daily life. So it's a, a topic that sometimes we don't think about. So thank you for underlined problems and the issues related to this kind of appliances. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's go on the last presentation, uh, always from Kraftingen by Marcus Falwell about uh, the optimization of cascade couplings for optimal use of low temperature uh, sources. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right then. Hello everyone. My name is Marcus. I'm sitting right across from, uh, from Clara, which presented right uh, now. Uh, and I will present a report written by Kraftringen and Kovi and a presentation made by my colleague uh, Martin Girov. So uh, this is not my area of expertise, but I will do my best uh, and make you understand. Uh, so this is focusing on the optimization of the production when there is a lot of residual heat available, uh, specifically optimizing cascade couplings for uh, heat pumps. And let me see. Yeah, well, that worked. Okay, so the objective of the report was to analyze the energy efficiency in heat pumps, uh, recovering heat uh, from, from low temperature sources, and to provide recommendations when you design these kind of uh, production systems. And we have relevance in, in both uh, Brunsag and in Hayutostrup within this project. So this was a theoretical study, but 
based on the actual operation that was installed at uh, the Max 4 plant in Lund. So the tool EES, not to be mixed with the ESS, uh, was used to calculate the, the performance of the heat pumps and used to make parameter studies varying different parameters for, for the heat pumps, both in, in Lund and in Hyatostrup. Uh, and this is the basic heat pump theory, where the, the coefficient of performance is dependent on the temperatures on the hot side and on the cold side. I think you're all, all familiar with this one. And what can we do to improve the, the COP? Well, we can split the heat, uh, the heating on the hot side in cascade couplings, meaning that we raise the temperature incrementally, in this case in four steps, and the temperature difference, uh, thus increasing the, the COP, is reduced. So in this case, we raise the temperature in four steps, the, the um, COP becomes better than the the, uh, the case when we only have one step. I don't know if we can go back because we can see the theoretical case here, we get the COP of uh, 4.8. In this case, uh, heating from 45 to 80 degrees, uh, meaning a conventional district heating system. And in this case, using the same temperatures on the hot side, uh, otherwise they'll split up in four, we get a, a raise by one unit to 5.8 in the coefficient of performance. So this is a good thing in theory. Then we look at the production sites at the Max 4 and in the Hyatostrup. Uh, so in Lund in Max 4, we have the heat pumps partly in operation. We cool the processes at Max 4 and we deliver the heat to our conventional district heating grid. So there are actually heat pumps ready and available and there are data from them to uh, put into the model to verify the, the function of the model. And when the, the low temperature district heating is developed at Brunswick, we will uh, just uh, simply raise the temperature by a little less. Uh, today we deliver 80 degrees to the conventional district heating area, but we will deliver 65, so only there there will be an increase of the COP. And then we have the heat pumps in Denmark, which are in partly in operation. This, this presentation are a couple of months old, I don't know if anything has changed, but um, they were in operation uh, this uh, spring with heat pumps at the City 2 shopping center, and they are uh, both in series and parallel. We will look closer at them uh, later on. Um, then we made a theoretical study of long distance heat pumps. You can say if you have uh, different heat sources and different heat needs in, in different areas, you can make like uh, a long distance uh, heat recovery. And that was that was also evaluated using the same model. So for for the for the Max Four, the setup that was already built before the project looks like this, and this is what has been used to to uh, uh, evaluate the parameter study as well. So on the hot side, you have cascade couplings. On the cold side, you have a mix of uh, parallel and cascade couplings. But the, the main thing here is that you raise the temperature in four steps, just like we saw in the previous theoretical picture. And in CT2, in Tostrup, you have two heat pumps, one primary heat pump with a piston compressor and a secondary with a screw, screw compressor. And you have a hot and cold side uh, and they are linked together as in, as in this picture. So 
So the parameter study, I can, as we actually are a bit ahead of schedule, we can look closer into this one uh, a bit later. But the evaluation of the performance of the MAX4 is used to, to verify the parameter studies and to uh, theoretically change for both uh, the Danish and the Swedish side, vary um, the temperatures, vary the internal flows, vary the working media to see what in theory would be the most optimal way of operating these systems and also as an input to further what do you say uh, to 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 new installation on how to theoretically build your your heat pump systems and example of the results from the max 4 looks like this where we vary the temperature on the hot side and we also vary the temperature on the cold side so what you can see in the graph is that at the starting point where we have 80 degrees supply temperature and we have a figure a uh, temperature difference of 40 degrees you get a cup of about three then with a reduced supply temperature going left in the graph you increase the coefficient of performance to at 65 you get a cop of four and if we would be able in the future to reduce the temperature even more let's say 55 degrees you get a cop of five so well the supply temperature has a large impact on the cop and also the return temperature uh, you see the the three parallel lines they are uh, the different uh, temperature differences so at a temperature difference of 40 degrees you get a much higher cup than a temperature difference of 20 degrees uh, i will take the main learnings and as we have some time left we can go uh, a bit deeper into the study itself afterwards but key is to have high cooling temperatures and low heating temperatures. This leads to a low differences, difference in, in temperatures, thus increasing the COP. And if you can divide the systems into temperature levels, that will also be increasing the COP as you, uh, like I said, the, re reduce the uh, temperature difference. The cascade couplings uh, is very good for, for high temperature differences as you split the flow, uh, split the uh, temperature rates into uh, more steps. And the optimal would be to have the same temperature lift in each step of the cascade, cascade coupling. And with the screw compressors, as in Denmark, it's important to have a high load uh, to have them working uh, properly that will we can look at that also a bit later. And also the working medias have an impact on the results. And the last one is to, when we uh, when you procure, procure these uh, facilities, it's important not only to look at the investment cost, but, also, but uh, rather the, the life cycle cost, as it might be more expensive to invest in this, um, cascade couplings where you have more compressors but the performance and the economy running them would be much better so look at the lifetime cost so i would just go forward to look at um, the parameter studies and this was the case at max 4 where as i said we we varied the parameters um, the internal uh flow distribution uh we varied the inlet temperature and we, we varied the um, supply and return temperature to the heating grids and also the refrigerant was varied uh, so all these uh, studies were made to to find the optimal in each case and the same goes for the uh, heliotostrup setup there were a bit more variations here as you, as you saw there are two different heat pumps uh, two different 
uh, ways of operating them as well. So some of just a, a short look at the results. This is from the Heliotostrup CT2 simulation case where you vary the, the flow. And as you can see, there are, um, yeah, to, the, the flow is important to, to, uh, to keep the temperature change low. Uh, if you get too high or too low flow, you get a too high temp dif temperature difference, thus uh, reducing the COP. This is also the, the, the one I mentioned in the results, uh, the main learnings that for the screw compressor, you need to have a high load level to get them working properly. When you go below 50%, you see that the efficiency is uh, quite heavily reduced, whereas the piston compressor works quite good at, at uh, most of the loads. Uh, this one might be the last slide. This is the theoretical case uh, for a long distance heat recovery where you have maybe different energy sources, different heat sources and different heat sinks at different places. So this might be looked at a very stretched out production uh, facility where you have heat pumps and you have consumers at the length from each other so you can uh, produce heat where it's available and then you just trans transfer it to the customers and and use uh, maybe a decentralized uh, heating system if you like but, well i think that would be all from from my part. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, this was the last slide. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, okay, that was the last slide. So um, it's time for question and answer. Uh, I will start with the chat ones. Uh, we have a question for Peer Olaf. Um, if you have, Peer, can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Okay. If you have Legionella in the primary water and get a leak, then you would have a spray in the city center. How to deal with that? if we have a leak in the, the city center um, and that you have aerosols in the city not in the residential buildings um, I'm not really sure we haven't looked into how to handle uh, this kind of incidents as we only looked at how to treat the domestic hot water not to treat the, the place that people go uh, out on the network Pierre, uh, we can hear I can, you I can very maybe, badly. Uh, I can maybe supplement, Gabriel. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, when you do such system, you normally have a filter, which is uh, filters if you have uh, Legionella in your cold water, which will be very little, but uh, so it will not be sprayed into to, the direct cooling, uh, evaporative cooling system. Okay, so Pierre, do you want to uh, add anything about that? Okay. No, I, I understood the, the question as if there was a leak in the system on the primary disk heating network and it was leaking out to the environmental on the screen to the public. Uh, and that had, we had a good deal with that. Okay. Mm, okay, thank you. Any other question for the speakers? Uh, okay. 
Okay, if uh, there are no questions about that, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I remember that the uh, webinar will be uploaded on the Cool DH website and on the Eurohita Empower YouTube uh, channel. And also in the Cool DH website, you will find the main variable that will be, will be presented uh, here. And uh, of course, uh, we are just in the middle of the lifetime of the project, so uh, a lot of uh, results uh, as yet to come. And so if you don't want to miss anything, you can follow uh, the next even workshop and webinars of CoolDH uh, uh, in the CoolDH website or in the uh, Eurate Empower uh, website in the section events. Uh, thank you again and have a nice day. Reto, if you have the last word about uh, the webinar, I don't know, who you as, as coordinator, or otherwise we can. Uh, from my side, also thank you. I don't have anything to add. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, you all. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy for the high level of attendance today. Uh, have a nice day. Bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, bye.